Hi, everyone. Welcome to the first and most fun episode of Change Food Eats. I am very excited to let you know that, to let, not to let you know, to share with you that my first guest is Steve Ritz. So he's from they Green Brunswick. What? I said, I think they can figure it out. I'm here. <laughs> it's no, not a huge surprise. I, <laughs> Steve, please. It's my first time. Okay. So, Steve. How are you? I am, well, thank God I am well. Obviously, I'm here and happy to be with you, but make no doubt about it, I'm disturbed, I'm perturbed, I'm upset with the current state of affairs um, around the country and around the world, and most importantly, in my very own neighborhood, but we're making the best of it. And most importantly, I'm here with you, hoping to share some passion, purpose, hope, and information today and get everyone who's tuning in to a better place. Oh, you're so kind, Steve. So just to start, for the one person who might watch this one day and wonder who is this strange guy with the yellow hat on, I'm going to read your bio. Steve oh. Ritz. I know. <laughs> ah, Steve. <laughs> hey, Steve. Steve, put your hat, put, put your other hat on and get your sign out. Okay, okay. Steve Ritz, hey, I'm reading your thing. Steve Ritz is the founder of nonprofit Green Bronx Machine and is the author of the best selling book, The Power of a Plant, known as America's favorite teacher. Stephen is responsible for creating the first edible classroom in the world, which he has evolved into the National Health, Wellness, and Learning Center. His curriculum is being used in hundreds of schools across the United States and internationally from Columbia to Dubai and beyond. Now, Steve, why are you wearing that hat? Oh, because we were just joking about doing the right thing. And I'm so proud that Spike Lee sent me a do the right thing street sign autograph to Green Bronx Machine and Steve Ritz. And uh, we were talking about a soundtrack for our entry and our opening which we both blew. And I was thinking, you know, it should be from Fight the Power. So, you know, I was going back to my 80s retro look, but thrilled to be here. And thank you for that way too kind introduction. Uh, everybody, I'm thinking of a Bruce Springsteen song, just so you know. But for you, Steve, I would definitely do do the right thing. So listen, you just- you just Fight the Power. I know. The man, the man, the man on so many levels. But let's go back to what you have. Oh, wait, before we start, what are you eating? Oh, so today, I, well, I'm here, just so you know, literally in what is my COVID classroom, where we have been conducting school nonstop since, you know, school was put on hold and hiatus. I'm here, so you can see, with my tower garden, my green shoes, my indoor garden. You've been to my living room. I've got all my students' books, a variety of puppets, the farm, all kinds of tools right here at my disposal. The children love seeing my green shoes. So I'm here and what's other one, you know, I've got my garden where literally a bulk of my lunch came from today. The rest came from right outside that door um, on my terrace. I've got some locally grown and tower garden grown lettuce. I've got some green bronze machine pickles. I've got some tomatoes from the farm. I've got an amazing New York Grow NYC Green Market Youth Market. So get on out and support our youth. Buy a fresh apple. I'm proud to be shoveling down my throat my favorite pesto, Gotham Greens pesto. And of course, I'll be topping it all off with my very favorite salad dressing. Well, one of my very favorite, but certainly the best in this line, Newman's Own, the sesame ginger, because children love this dressing. And I love Newman's Own, where 100% of the proceeds are donated to charity. So I'm proud to walk the talk and talk the walk and eat the food, but I'm not spitting lettuce at you and don't want to hear how I crunch too much when I eat. So I will eat selectively and efficaciously. Yes, I have a glass of iced tea, unsweetened, I might add, filled with Bronx honey. So I I'm have, I have, I have Newman's, I have Newman's own organic green tea. Oh, I look like a glass of scotch. No, no, it's green uh, tape. No, that would that would be perfect to put up with me. So, so why the shoes? What's the significance of the shoes? Well, you know, the shoes are the children love the green shoes. They also love the bow tie and the cheese hat. So, uh, you know, I tell them as soon as I can get my shoes on and come to you, I will. But remarkably, we've been able to do a lot of great community outreach. Um, 
I'm reading to children daily. We just launched summer camp two weeks ago. So Green Bronze Machine does have a CDC compliant summer camp where children are farming, they're visiting, they're tasting food, they're delivering food, um, they're creating recipes. So I'm really excited about that. But I literally have been connecting since COVID with people around the world and people get a big kick. They really want to know, do I wear green shoes? So I keep them right there. And it reminds me that, you know, I may not be out and about yet, but I will be coming soon and can't wait to do it. So, um, so it's a symbol is, of, of all that is possible. Is that your tower garden behind That's you? I mean, you really became known. Tower. This is my home tower garden. Uh, you'll see I've got all kinds of things growing there from Swiss chard. Check out, you want to see something amazing? Got yes. these amazing scallions. Like, they're serious. I'm growing some serious green onion back here. Some amazing microgreens. Uh, there is uh, my little flat Stanley version of me. The cheese hat did not grow in the tower garden. It grows on the tower garden. Um, I've got a variety of lettuces, some good celery in the back. Um, I use it as a teaching garden. This garden is about 24 days old right here in the beautiful B to the X Bronx baby locally grown. And uh, the rest is being picked off and consumed right here. Shall I have a tomato? I will have some radish while you have some tomato. I have some radish. Let me make sure I show people how to dine. You this know, is very hot. This is very elegant. So uh, I'm here. Thank you. Delicious. So that's your indoor farm. But you just mentioned summer camp. Correct. This is so bad. I have radish in my mouth while I'm talking. I can but see you mentioned. Here. You mentioned your uh, farm. So you have an outdoor farm. Talk to us about that. And I'm going to put you on full screen so people don't have okay. to look at me. So Green Bronx Machine has the largest organic based soil farm in the Bronx that was student built. We have been farming this plot of land for close to 15 years and on an abandoned city street. Um, if you go to our website, the Green Bronx Machine website, you can see it. Uh, there's also a great YouTube video called Farm Raising in the Bronx. And we grow over 5,000 pounds of locally grown, soil-based, 100% organic food in the Bronx with children in a huge community effort. Um, this year has been no different with pandemic and pandemonium around it. We were able to create a bunch of socially distant um, community action days where we brought people in from across New York City and Westchester. It was remarkable. We had congregations up. You know, the, the congregations for Jewish congregations from Manhattan, churches, faith-based organizations, mosques from Yonkers and parts of, you know, the North Bronx and wonderful people from Scarsdale come together. It was literally a mini United Nations where we put 5,000 plants into the ground and really grew something greater and got to talk about it while planting in an eco-distance manner. So much so that it made the National Council for Science and the Environment front page the project. You turned off the volume, Diane. You may hear me, but I can't hear you. Okay. I can hear you laughing. Ever the charmer you are. This is like a shit show. Anyway, oh my God, this is so much fun. So okay. do you, how can we, we have to be very serious, Steve. This yeah, no, these are serious times and there's nothing wrong with laughing at ourselves and each other, but I don't want to downplay the moment. No, and I'm not either. I not just, sure. after four months being locked in basically isolation, I go a little loopy every now and then. And I do think that we need, we all need to not forget that it is very serious. There's horrible things happening, but there is still life. There is still hope, you know, and, and we need, I think, to help inspire others and to feel inspired by things. So the farm is amazing. I mean, especially in this heat wave, like for those, those of you not in New York, there's a massive heat wave going on right now. How do people, if they want to volunteer, do you do organized volunteer? Do they go to your Facebook page and just request? Like, how do you so we, have a, we have an open community day every Thursday, and we've been blessed with ongoing volunteers. People reach out to us via Facebook. So that's Green Bronx Machine Facebook or me at Stephen Ritz, or they send us emails. Um, we are in the height of the season. We've been harvesting food. We're getting ready to continue harvesting food. But that's just one of the many initiatives that we've been involved in here at Green Bronx Machine since the pandemic took. And yeah. what else? What else? Because I know you've been delivering food. Talk a little about that because I organized a group in the East Village called East Village Neighbors. Because when the pandemic first happened, New York was hit so hard. There were people who were like starving. Like people, it took the city a few months to get the food. Right. So let me give kudos where it's due. Kudos to the city uh, for getting its act together and really having to respond. 
But right. you know, as, as quick as I like to talk and as quick as I like to move it, it's tough to turn a cruise ship in the harbor. So it has taken time. But you know, immediately when schools got closed down, we remained inside school because part of Green Bronx Machine's mission is that we grow food in school that serves local cancer patients. And we have 26 cancer patients that depend on our groceries weekly for subsistence. Wow. And these are people who are tethered to oxygen machines. You know, they're 20 stories up in public housing. They can't even come out right now. Right. So when the pandemic hit and they closed schools, we were fine and we were growing foods and then they put us out. So we had to transfer the food, the farm, partially to our living room where it lived for a while. And then we started reconfiguring ways that we could get our seniors healthy, fresh food. And then uh, we took on 55 of the neediest and most vulnerable families across the South Bronx. And through our sustainable gangster campaign, um, which is the purchase of a t-shirt or, or a donation, we were able, we are on a weekly basis, able to source thousands of pounds of food out of the Hunts Point market, food that you know would have in some cases gone to waste because restaurants are closed and people, there's no financial incentive for it to come to New York. And other where food is actually a peak of freshness and has no market value for supermarkets or restaurants or retail. And we're capturing that. We start at two o'clock in the morning on Thursday, get out to Hunts Point, commandeer trucks, load up the van, bring it back, go through a loading, unloading and packing process, and then deliver across a 26 mile route every Friday from sunup till sunrise, sundown across the Bronx. Um, it's some of the most gratifying work that you can imagine. And we go door to door. We then launched a Zoom delivery uh, program, a Zoom delivery cooking program, because you can't eat a laptop. And I want to make sure that people in this day and age understand that, you know, there's a difference between the Green New Deal and the Screen New Deal. And in a lot of ways, this Screen New Deal and distance learning is not effective nor efficacious for children. It's great to have celebrities online talking smack, but when children are stuck 20 stories up and grocery stores are closed, and they're eating nothing more than pop tarts and potato chips and watching celebrities talk about wonderful things. We felt it was critical to get fresh ingredients into these students' hands the day before, then coalesce them online. And we, have, we are the only program that I know of in New York City that actually delivers food to students and families the day before and then cooks online the day after where everybody's on board. And it has taken off like wildfire. Oh, that's great. But can you also explain to people, because you, you said this to me a few months ago and it just, it just is something I hadn't thought about that children can be given a laptop, but what's the deal with internet? Right, so first and foremost, you know, distance learning is an effective tool for some people. For other people, it is absolutely not. Not understanding how to use the internet, how to access the internet, to afford the internet. God bless my wife, Lizette, who's not here today, um, joining us. Uh, she's actually with the children. You know, she made sure not only did we access hundreds of, hundreds of devices and get them into the parents' hands, but then had to access an internet provider and for many teach them. And for so many of our children, who are being raised by grandparents or elders or a non-English speaking member of the family, these are Herculean challenges that, oh, let's go to Microsoft Teams, baby, and Zoom. Yeah, shall we? Well, you know, that's not a realistic expectation for some. And then the flip side is online instruction is only as good as the online instruction being provided. Now, there are some community school districts across New York City that were prepared for this and really had a great connectivity system and, you know, children are online and engaged from eight o'clock until three o'clock daily. There is some where people are just posting homework up and hope that they check it in. And, you know, so the disconnect around distance learning, particularly in the communities that are most vulnerable to COVID, have traditionally had some of the poorest rates of attendance and test scores and compliance. You know, it, it's just a force multiplier of negativity. So we are determined to be a force multi multiplier for positivity and all that is possible. And it's been wonderful. It's, it's been great. So um, tell me about um, your relationship with the Department of Education, because you aren't a teacher in a classroom, but your wellness center is in a school. So, that like, is so explain so, like your relationship right. and what's going on with the Department of Ed. So there's a huge misnomer that I have a horrible relationship with the Board of Ed. And that, that could not be further from the truth. Now, many years ago, when I first met you, I was a loud, outspoken critic of a lot that was going on in the Board of Ed. 
and in many ways I was correct. However, I'd like to think with age and time, um, I'd become a kinder, gentler, more focused <laughs> voice. It's, you know, I always say my dear friend, Senator Gustavo Rivera says, Steve, it's tough to drink out of a fire hydrant or a fire hose. So I really focused my efforts. And, you know, quite frankly, we were just a little ahead of our time. Green Bronze Machine and the work Steve Ritz was, was doing was way ahead of our time. You know, I wanted to open up schools and people called me a communist, a community ag agitator. It turns out that some of my biggest proponents have actually been fired. Their schools have been closed and they've been arrested and charged with crime. So, you know, the oh truth is um, but I have become far more focused on being an effective educator. So the bottom line is I could not be more thrilled by the Department of Education. I'm proud that the Department of Education actually used my book for professional development. I'm proud to be partnering with dozens of schools across New York City. And of course, if you had to ask me who my biggest food hero is in New York City, it is without a doubt, George Edwards, you know, the coordinator of the School Garden to School Cafe program for the New York City Department of Education. Hmm. I look forward to returning back to the Board of Ed in some shape, manner or form. But when I left, I left because I felt compelled to do what I wanted to do without restriction. And listen, We've gone on to build a model that is a top 10 health and wellness program in the country and top 100 program in the world. We are touching tens of thousands of students daily. I got to give a lot of credit to you. If it wasn't for you and the forum you afforded me, um, you know, people would have never heard about me. I'm still waiting to meet whoever that guy Ted is. But you I, know, pay, I pay Steve to say that everyone, you know. Well, yeah, you pay me, but you know, I do like to give credit where credit is due. But my relationship with the Board of Ed is wonderful. I'm appreciative of them. Most importantly, they are appreciative of me. And you know, I singly believe that public education is the greatest lever. We as a nation, we as New York City, and my beloved South Bronx community has to affect positive social and economic and behavioral change. So I'm a huge advocate for public education, and I'm thrilled to see so much of the changes that so many of the changes that are happening. And you know, let the, not be confused. Stephen Ritz is very pro. New York City Department of Education. You know what's fascinating? It's trying to figure out when you breathe. <laughs> I don't know, is that a necessary body function? <laughs> so you said a term that I think is key in, in the answer you just gave, which is outspoken critic. 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 I heard from a little birdie that someone might be running for office. Well, Can you talk about that at all? Sure. Um, I, I'm very grateful to be doing the work that I'm doing it. And believe you me, Green Bronze Machine has only scratched the surface. But I'm also, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm concerned about the proliferation of nonprofit work in so many sectors across New York City and the nation. And I'm not anti-nonprofit. So let me be clear about that. I say thank you to every single person whose heart and head and actions are in the right place, place today and every day. And I salute you. But I also realize that philanthropy is not the answer in a capitalist society and that we can't run an economy on nonprofit work. So I am a huge advocate of policy. And here's the deal, Diane. Listen, philanthropy and nonprofit work will inspire everyone to send bottles of water to Flint, Michigan. And that's great because right now we need a lot of bottles of water in Michigan. So the more bottles we send, the happier we are and the more successful we feel. But policy and change will ensure that the goddamn pipes are fixed, that water quality is preserved, and people who violate that sanctity will be sent to jail. And that's why I'm becoming a policy advocate. So you're going to see me really shift my focus towards working. Will I run for office? That remains to be seen. I've got plenty of work to do here at Green Bronze Machine and that's as Steve Ritz. But I do have my eye on a couple of offices that I think offices that I think I could be effective at. And, and we'll see, you know, the one thing I've learned to say is never say never. Well, Steve Ritz, you have my vote. Well, thank you kindly. I might not be in your neighborhood, but I will move up there just like right. a well, You never know what position I'm running for. I will say- I'm Ah, a mayor? Let me, let me put it out there right now for those who are watching. You know, I really want to advocate and take a moment to call attention to, I think is possibly the greatest candidate for New York City mayor. And that is my dear friend, Eric Adams. So from Bronx to Brooklyn, you know, he has been a champion of the green movement of health, wellness, nutrition, and plant-based diets and an advocate for children 
and inclusivity for years. So I am watching Eric very carefully. Closer to home, I was thrilled to see Jamal Bowman, um, you know, Rock Elliott Angle. Uh, you know, there are a lot of good people and, and change is coming. And, and that's the most important thing because we are in the midst of a horrible moment. And, you know, and I'll give you some context, Diane. In our immediate circle of friends, families, and colleagues, we've lost over two dozen people. Um, wow. That and I have had to help families claim bodies um, and understand what that's like. We signed on for a lot, but we didn't sign on for that. So in that moment, I want to realize, let those lives not be lost in vain. And I am really hoping that this moment brings us to a movement where we never get back to normal, but instead get back to better. And well, that's that really what's exciting about what can happen, um, because change needs to happen across so many specters. And that leads me to the question that I will be asking everybody during this um, lunchtime talk show. Uh, what, what do we need to do to create a food system where everyone can eat healthy food? Okay, so first and foremost, we need to pay food workers fairly. In some ways, you know, we're seeing so many restaurants and so many businesses go out of business. And I think in some ways that's kind of like a big market equalizer. You know, people who are producing the food have got to get paid. Listen, we can't grow enough food right now in the Bronx and a lot of small farmers who are producing food and treating people fairly and getting it to market are doing well. So what we've got to start doing as a nation is start thinking about things like seasonality, locally grown. You don't need to have, you know, kumquats 365 days a year. We need to start thinking about eating seasonably, seasonally, eating reasonably. We've also got to start thinking about living wage. Um, because, listen, the more we get rid of processed food, fast food, or minimize its efficacy in society, the more we are giving birth to fair food. And fair food and fair wages is the greatest enabler of the other thing that, I mean, there are some real policy changes I'd like to see, which again gets into my politics. I'd like to see the reduction of fast food restaurants in certain zip codes, you know, that they'd be capped out. Um, I'd like to see the way we use SNAP and EBT in certain stores that are close to school, that if they're selling liquor and cigarettes, they can't use EBT because I don't like children seeing that. If you have a six front, six foot window storefront and a seven foot bong or hookah pipe in the window, you should not be allowed to accept EBT or food stamps simply because I don't want to see ch children seeing that. You know, we've got the Chaluli Crack Pipe Museum, the Chaluli, Chaluli Glass Pipe Museum um, in many marginalized neighborhoods because that's what's effective. And I'm not saying I am anti-tobacco or, you know, certain kinds of substances, but what I am saying is I'm pro-child and I don't want children seeing that. And I don't want children understanding how that is acceptable at such a young age. The other thing I'd love to do is see a reduction in, you know, the way children are marketed to, you know, very publicly. I'm calling out Shaquille O'Neal for that stupid, big, fat, ridiculous shakaroni pizza. Shaquille O'Neal, shame on you. And plus, you're getting fat. You know, marketing pizza and pepperoni with extra cheese and extra salt and extra size to children is a shame. It's a crime. And you should be ashamed of yourself. And people need to take a stand. We've got to stop looking at children as epicenters of profit and really realize that their input you know, is our output. We've got to stop feeding off the dysfunction and dysfunctionality of cities and children and communities. And, and th this is the work that's near and dear to me. So that's amazing. Thank you. But back to the farm, I agree with you. I, I, I hopefully over time we'll be able to get people on the show who can say how, like I 100% agree that needs to be done. Um, but how we can make those changes. But with you, because you have the farm, and maybe you could, could explain a, a bit, you give the food away to the community. Can people ask you for it? Like, how do you do it? And do you think other areas can replicate what you're doing? And do you make any effort to try to help other communities, plant farms, et cetera, et cetera? And if not, my program, Plant Eat Share, would be more than happy to try to help develop resources because I think every neighborhood should have its own community farm where people can. Right. Well, first and foremost, hey, look, you know, you want me to call out the botanical gardens? They don't need glad. They need to open up some of that space and let people farm there. Um, have you, you know, tried? Uh, they don't call me back. 
And, you know, quite frankly, I, I feel I do other things for the community. You know, I've got to figure out, Diane, in my, in, with my time, what juice is worth my squeeze. Um, you know, so back when I was screaming like a madman, I was making a lot of noise. Now, listen, Green Bronx Machine touches 500 schools across this nation. Um, and we're doing it with what? One employee. So we have gone from being disruptive to delivery. So yes, we help people plant. Yes, we provide advice. Yes, we provide expertise. And most importantly, we provide the inspiration, motivation, and perspiration to show that it can be done and that we are the ones we are waiting for. My mindset is very simple, Diane. I am not here to be my brother's keeper and I'm not making fun of any program. So, but my mind, the, the, the calculus of my advocacy is really to be my brother's brother, not to be my brother's keeper. Um, you know, to be the light. Well, I guess, I guess I'm asking. Kind of the light shining at the end. So growing food locally, growing food indoors and educating children about what food is and how it impacts them is absolutely critical. So every time I keep a burger out of a kid's belly and replace it with a banana, those children understand that we've saved 400 gallons of water. God knows how many cow farts are not in the atmosphere right now. And right. think about this, bananas are better for them than a burger will ever be. Right, and, I, and I, the reason I'm asking is because you are, um, you know, you're you're a rare type of personality where you are, you speak eloquently, you're very passionate, and you get shit done. And not everyone gets shit done. So I guess what I was, what I'm getting at is, you know, if if somebody wanted to hire your services, I I don't want what you do to end with you. I don't want no, what you not. do. And you know, I'll tell you this. So thank you for those lovely compliments. Eloquent, I don't know. Good looking, definitely not. Do I get shit done? Yeah, but you know who really gets shit done? Um, poor people. Yeah. The world has no idea how hard it is to be poor. Um, you know, come visit us in public housing where we have 45 buildings and on any given day, the elevators aren't working. Where more often than not, the electricity is working. Try being a single parent, making minimum wage with two or three children, each in a different school and getting a goddamn elevator to come pick you up on the 20th floor in the morning or walking down 20 flights of stairs carrying a baby carriage so you can get to some place that may or not be open because some person from the suburbs who thinks they're blessing you with a job and running childcare for way too much money, um, you know, takes care of your child. So on a day-to-day -day basis, you can't believe the heroes that I meet. And that's really what this work is all about. The untold heroes, the unsung heroes, the people who are getting up, keeping two, three, four jobs done. Yeah. You know, I've got grandparents raising scores of children, children who are 20 stories up in two bedrooms with 10, 10 family members. These are the real heroes. And you know what? They don't have social media budgets. They don't have a media and communications person. Right. They don't have anybody. And neither do I. So, so how, how can they be? How that's happening. How do you think, because this, this ties in also with the whole Black Lives Matters movement and things that are going on, like, like what are some suggestions or ideas you have? How can it become more equitable? How can people like this get funding or salary, living wage? Because I agree with you. And I also, from the get-go when I started my career, I don't believe in telling people what to do. I believe in providing resources, but then letting people solve problems in their own community, but they should be compensated for it. Like, what do you think needs to be done? So what needs to be done first and foremost, so, you know, big kudos to the Black Lives Matter mo movement. Um, I hope they matter enough to everybody. That's really, uh, Black Lives need to matter and they may need to put an M more. Um, they need to matter more because, you know, th that's the way our country is really moving. Um, we are becoming a predominantly black and brown country and to not accept that it is absurd to not be inclusive. And, you know, I think it really comes down to understanding a couple of things. It need, people need to understand the notion of equality, equity, and justice. You know, I, you meet people every day, and I actually meet a lot of people who I believe I'm not racist, or they are not racist. And then they proudly say, I'm not racist. Um, and to say, I'm not racist is not a badge of normalcy. That should be a given. Um, so the fact that people say, I'm not racist is enough. No. How are you actively anti-racist in all that you do? How do you understand how your privilege affects others and you in, in the bigger scheme of things? 
So equality is me bringing a little child to a baseball game and we both stand in front of the fence and try and watch the game. And the little kid's on his tippy toes and I'm sitting there with a, I'm six feet tall and, you know, my cheese hat is blocking some other person behind me from seeing the game. That's equality. Equity means I get a chair, I get a ladder, and that child is at the same vantage point, eye to eye with me seeing the game. And we are seeing the game as peers. But justice means that we remove the systemic barriers that prevent, that, that actually say we need these fences and create these fences. And that's what we need to do. So, you know, in terms of community development, I'm very excited to see some of the defund police movement and activity going on, because I believe that it's going to be more about educating ourselves than policing ourselves and taking communities and creating, you know, it's taking unproductive places and turning them into aspirational spaces. Case in point, my dear friend Jonathan Taves in Chicago and the Chicago Blackhawks and the By the Hand um, Foundation, they're actually, since some of the riots, they are buying out the leases of liquor stores. Because what do we know about liquor stores in, in you know, marginalized communities? Number one, it's people are not going there to celebrate birthdays. Sometimes they are, but they are really kind of epicenters for a lot of other negative social determinants of health. And I think that's an accurate statement. So by getting rid of these liquor stores and creating pop-up indoor farms and pop-up food centers, we are empowering local people to take control of their own lives. And by really creating, you know, the new thing as people are fleeing cities and we're seeing this everywhere, I'm sure you're seeing it in Manhattan um, where you are, we have an opportunity to create true blended community. And what do blended communities mean? You know, places where landlords, you know, traditionally landlords, if they don't rent the space, they get a tax write off. Well, I'd like to see landlords, if they don't rent the space within six months and adjust the rent to reflect new market value, get fined. Imagine that. Imagine holding landlords responsible. On the flip side, if they want to give up that space to a nonprofit or a community-based organization or a startup or an incubation site, they should be afforded the same tax benefit and tax, you know, tax break that they would get if the place was vacant. This would change the nonprofit landscape. It would change the for-profit landscape and create blended, inclusive communities for all. So, so what's, I can talk, 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 or I can run for really? office. Actually, way to change. And you're going to see the most important thing is disseminating education so that people are making change. And I'm proud well, exactly. of I was, political so candidates so and what's, elected officials. What's the name of the guy, the gentleman who is doing taking up the leases of the liquor stores? What's uh, his name? Jonathan Taves and the Chicago Blackhawks. Oh, really? That's in Chicago, yeah. And I'm you know, listen, I'm not moving to Chicago yet. Um, but, you know, I love it there, and I, but I'm really being very effective in lending advice and expertise to these organizations, and, you know, and across the country. And that's really what this is all about. It's well, exactly. Really talk about it is. sharing resources, sharing, you know, it's great. It's not about, ooh, let's go raise more money for executive salaries and real estate and a social media campaign. If I get- No, and this is, but this is- Nonprofit note about- But this love. is where the disparity comes in is I don't know if you're being compensated or not. I just know that a lot of times when people, especially in the nonprofit space who are on more of a grassroots level, when they develop a certain expertise, they're sort of expected to give their time and their resources for free. And like, how are we gonna pay rent? Like, I don't, I just feel like there's such a disparity there. I do, I do think more people are talking about the nonprofit industrial complex. I have nothing against That's nonprofits. That's a great term. It is an industrial complex. Make no. about it. I've been besieged by more nonprofits seeking money and more for-profit nonprofits trying to tell me ways to raise more money and do more effective things besides anything but the work than you could ever imagine. I know. So you say your reach is national, but I know your reach is actually global. Absolutely. You do you want to talk a little about the UAE and what you do in Dubai and all that? Well, so, you know, I believe that if you have a good plan, um, that plan makes dollars and it makes sense. So it's really noteworthy to know that the school proposals that I offered the New York City Department of Education and largely reflective of some of the programming that I'm now doing now were purchased and used in the UAE and some of the finest and, you know, private schools in the world. So, you know, 
Rich children have the are is entitled to good health and good nutrition as poor children, you know, and good nutrition should be a basic human right. So the fact that we are opening up successful schools around the world goes to show you that I might not have been as crazy as people thought I was. I just needed to be a bit more focused. You know, I could not be more proud to say that, uh, you know, two weeks ago, I was the, uh, I hosted a global United Nations that you wow. connected 40 countries and over 40,000 students from around the world online. It was the coolest Zoom call I ever did. And wow. I'll tell you, the children were wonderful. They were behaved. They are the new change agents. I'm, you know, I'm going to be part of the world's largest lesson in the fall where over 1 million students and 1 million teachers have signed on. And what are we going to be doing? We're going to be giving away resources for F-R-E-E. -E. But I believe there's a hybrid, hybrid blend, you know, a sliding scale model. And so many of the champions that I agree with and heroes that I know you love do the same thing. I, you, you can't, you know, I, I can't live for free. Right. But I believe that certain people, private schools and private entities dedicated to public service have a duty to themselves and to their others. And it actually makes great economic sense because you're creating market share in future employees. Not everyone wants to grow up and live on welfare. And the notion that people in marginalized communities want to be these welfare receiving, sit on your back fat cats, could not be further than the truth. I urge everybody to get out to public housing. And sure, you're going to always see a stereotype if that's what you're looking for. But the untold heroes are the people going up and down those staircases. The untold heroes are the essential workers. You know, the untold heroes are the people who are, you know, literally, Part of my change in diet, bringing it back to food is, you know, listen, I am not a vegan, so I want to put it out there. I eat a lot less meat and a lot less animal protein than ever before, but I don't want anyone to die so that I could have a burger. And I think when children understand that, or a chicken McNugget, and when children understand that, everything changes because neither do they. Yeah, so I hope I hope that with the pandemic and all the issues in the processing plants and slaughterhouses, people I hate to call them slaughterhouses, but that's what they are. And people are being forced to work and there are horrific COVID problems with people getting ill and dying. I'm hoping this sheds a light on the problem with the industrial meat system. And again, I'm vegetarian, but I promote pasture raised meat. I do not judge. I am not telling somebody what to do, but the conditions are horrific. Right. Um, so, and they don't get living, they're not paid living wages. And they're not paid living wage. And, you know, I don't believe anybody grows up wanting the worst for their children. People grow up wanting the best. We've just got to take out some of the mixed messaging and, and redefine the way we educate people and give them access. And this is going to be, and here, you know, the case in point, the COVID crisis provides a great opportunity for that. This is the greatest opportunity in the world for parents to sit, you know, as kitchens become the new classrooms, right. sitting around the kitchen with your children and understanding food is critical. Um, and we're getting great responses. The ability to grow food in cities is absolutely possible. I'm doing it here. We have children growing microgreens. I'm not saying you're going to feed your whole family off your windowsill, so don't get me wrong. But I'm saying understanding this process and understanding the inputs and outputs and systems creates for children and communities that are more oriented around healthy activities and less single serve products and waste. And that's better for everybody. Right. So now, you, you mentioned sustainable palates, things that are fun, things that take a long time to chew. I know you were teasing me about how crunchy my lettuce was, but that's because it's locally grown and that's because it's fresh and it takes a long time yeah. to and it's crispy and it's crunchy and it's delicious and children love it too. Mine is too. I'm just putting myself on mute when I okay. crunch into it. I'm um, not, no, it was a good laugh. I wasn't laughing at you. I was tickled because it isn't it amazing to like hear fresh food, not just taste and smell fresh food, but to absolutely hear it. hearing and smelling fresh food is yes. game changing. So you mentioned uh, just a little bit ago about people moving out of cities. I mean, what do you think? I mean, this isn't really food related, but what is your feeling about the mass exodus? I spoke with my mail carrier um, because I had to help my mother. I was out of town for a while, put my mail on hold, whatever, irrelevant, but talked to my mail carrier. He told me that in one week, just one week in zip code 10003, which is where I live, 10,000 people left. 10,000 in one week. 
So it doesn't surprise me. I mean, what do you see? the Upper West Side, the Upper East Side, that are literally vacant, literally vacant. You're seeing rents plummet, retail pricing, selling. No one's looking to buy an apartment in New York City right now, unless you're uber wealthy. Um, you're seeing prices in certain communities for homes go through the roof. You know, yeah. And I'm really afraid of the looming mortgage crisis and unemployment that is coming. So there are a lot of things. Um, but, you know, listen, I think we have an opportunity to redefine urban living, suburban living, and healthy living. But most importantly, it's got to get to equitable and just. And again, you know, I just really want to salute, take my hat off to everyone who is out there marching, protesting, writing letters, and doing legal action in support of Black Lives Matter and in support of policy and advocacy, because it's about time we make this not the, not the norm, not the, the gold standard, but the norm. Right, right. I just, I, I get concerned just about how much time it's gonna take because, I mean, I live on First Avenue, I live in the East Village. This is probably one of the trendiest places in the world right now. I was here before it was trendy. It's part, it's part of the what place, I'm sorry? It's one of the trendiest places in the world right now. Like it's very trendy where I live. It was very artsy, cracked in 25 years ago when I moved here, but now there's a lot of multi, multi-million dollar condos, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm only saying that when I walked out the door um, yesterday evening, they have put like patios, they've built these wooden patio things outside in all the parking areas for restaurants to do outdoor dining. They're just nothing. They're just right outside me. It's dark and the restaurants have not reopened to serve. And it scares me. Restaurants are going to have to reconfigure the way they do business as well. I don't know if they're going to make it. I I'll have some restaurant tours on. Listen, some are not, and that's a sad reality. And I don't wish anybody ill, but the traditional system has not been fair, nor was it ever built on equity. So in order to get to a better place, there is some redistribution that's going to happen. There, listen, there are restaurants that I've loved, and I'm sad to see them go out of business. I really am. Don't get me wrong. My heart bleeds for people who have spent years working to build a business. But that business was built on, you know, the, the under, larger, perhaps lack of understandings of how much unjust there is in the world. And, and here we are. Yeah, I just, I, I guess restaurants, I don't know enough about them. I have to get some experts on because I know their profit margins are slim. So it's not like restaurant owners are, you know, right. Bezos or Gates. Is. You know, I mean, there are investment groups that invest in them that do make money off them. Right. So I the just whole, am concerned. Model. Realize, you know, the coronavirus, the COVID virus has really been a huge x-ray into our society. Yeah. It, it's an x-ray in one clear image, very black and white, where our priorities are and where our priorities are not. And, you know, the COVID virus, the COVID crisis, this pandemic, you know, this virus that we're experiencing is really symptomatic or emblematic of three larger viruses that exist, the, the root cause. And the root cause is racism, greed, and corruption. And when you understand that those are the real problems, then we can hopefully get to better. But to blame it on a germ, that's absurd. To blame it on one group of people is absurd. You know, we should have seen this coming and been prepared, and I realize that's a whole Well, they did problem. see it. It but, was, it was. Yeah, we don't want to get into this, but, but the CDC has been saying for decades. But this is, people have been saying this for decades. So this moment is an absolute x-ray into where our priorities were or weren't. Now, are we brave enough to confront that? I don't know, because the opposite of courage is not cowardice, Diane. The opposite of courage is conformity, because a dead fish can go with the flow. And for many years, everybody was content to go with the flow. So the degree to which we resist injustice is the degree to which we are free. And we really need to no longer go with the flow if we want to get to a better place, not only as people, but as a planet. Okay, so the title of this show is going to be A Dead Fish Can Go With The Flow. I'm writing that down. Dead fish do go with the flow. I know, no, that's that sums a lot up. Like that is- and We've been going with the flow for years. It worked, oh, let's not buck the system. No, it's time to 
fight the power. You know, bring so back the soundtrack. Where's your hope? Pardon me? Where's your hope? I'm not a fight the power person. I have another idea, but where's your hope? Like, where's your, what do you think? Because it is great. We can sit here, we can say this is bad. And this is, it's all true. Everything we've talked oh, about. I have so true. much hope, it's insane. Now you can't eat hope, but where's my hope? My hope is every day with children. You know, my hope is, hello, I'm knocking on your head. It's that McFly moment. My hope is that someone besides you who's laughing is actually listening. Then that, you know, people pay attention. Because you don't have to be great to start, but you have to start right. in order to be great. And right. no one can do everything. So we don't need a million Steve Ritzes. I sure don't want them. Um, but you got to do something. No one can do everything, but everyone can do something. And that's the most important thing to realize. We can make one simple change on a daily basis, on a weekly basis, that ultimately affects a much larger change. And that's the calculus of my advocacy. See, for me, I mean, I'm with you. I mean, what I experienced when COVID happened, because no one knew what it was and everyone was so scared and we were afraid to go outside and you'd leave your, your packages outside for three days and everything had to be swabbed. And it was just, it was scary. Um, I and hundreds of people in the city and like you just jumped into action because it's like, okay, I'm healthy. I have a roof over my head. How can I get food to other people? What can I do? Let's organize it. So the mutual aid network, so that's where my hope lies. Bottom up, on the ground, mutual aid, neighbor to neighbor, that's how stuff's gonna change. And I- you 100% also, um, and while I am not a very religious person, uh, I'm certainly, I, I do have a certain amount of faith. The faith-based community mm. has been remarkable. And you know, to see Muslims, Christians, Jews, Methodists, Presbyterians, and all those other Irians that I can't pronounce, um, you know, come out to a farm in the middle of the Bronx and work side by side with my children is amazing. Um, you know, I was up north. I think I sent you a picture. I was in North Country. You know, to be able to farm with Mennonites and people, you know, to help grow food and do things for people is amazing. So the faith-based community, um, you know, I think they have a true North Star in some regard. So it's been very inspiring. And then the most important thing is really children. To see the changes that we've been able to track and trace through the years of, of, of the work that I've been doing, and even the children we come into contact with on a regular basis, they are becoming kinder, gentler, more empathetic human beings, children who you know understand where their food comes from, that they don't need to eat McDonald's and where to, you know, we live in two, and I, you know, half the South Bronx has two hundred dollars sneakers and ninety nine cent meals. It's absurd. Right. Um, right. You know, the other thing is we got to start really rebuilding some of our resources and value some of the institutions that disseminate knowledge. And you know, you've always been very good at sharing resources. You've always been a resource and people connector. Um, places like the New York City Food Policy Center. We need to fund these organizations. You know, they are the go to places. It wouldn't be a Steve Ritz if there were, well, if not for you, Viraj, and a couple of other people, but certainly for the New York City Food Policy Center. Resources that are open access to people, that right. provide places of aggregation, congregation, and dissemination. And I certainly don't need another nonprofit stealing their resources, putting it in their newsletter, and saying, oh, by the way, our donations are down. This is what we're providing. So, you know, we've got to get to a better place and do it quickly. Yeah, we're not going to go down that rabbit hole, but it is that is a very unfortunate thing. No, I've just seen over the years. It's no, I know. Go I know. Well, I'm going to piss some people off, and I get it. It's your first show. Let's not piss people <laughs> off. But you don't have to. Too late. Too late. Yeah, too late. I'm here. You know, let's talk about that. Okay. We, but know, listen, this is my thing, and I have seen it. I have seen over my 20 plus. Own organization. I oh, know. Yeah. Well, you know, and I think people don't realize that a lot of nonprofits and a lot of people doing stuff like this, we're not getting a salary. Like we're not, we don't have funding. It's what I've noticed is that the very, very large, and I've been in some, and man, they have got office buildings in Midtown Manhattan. Like they have so much money and so much overhead. They sort of suck out the nonprofit dollars. And they and the expect people, everyone to give them their services yes. for free, but you would have bid yes. on a silent auction for bullshit you don't need. Yes. You know? And then people I like you, as it is. But you, know, you know me, I love gardening. So let's, I, I'll take the hit on this one. No one loves gardening with children more than I do. I have the most effective and most productive school garden in New York City per square foot. 
and we built it ourselves and we're waiting for the, for the scaffolding to come down. But no one needs a hundred, no, the schools, marginalized schools and marginalized communities don't need $200,000 school gardens before they need four new teachers and a working computer center. So oh, you yeah, you're thinking of the wrong group. You're not, I'm, as, as, a, as a school principal, as a committed educator, I'm not spending it on a garden. I'm yes. spending it on reducing class sizes and bridging the technology and equity can competency gap. And yeah, the all school gardens I know. Love to put black and brown children on their website and say, oh, help us raise money so we can build another 300,000 school garden uh, for the poor kids of East Harlem or the South Bronx or Rockaway. Shame on you. Shame on you. Go away. Okay, so the school garden I know of was a million dollars. Case in point. Ooh. Yeah. I so I agree with you. Million dollars. But the other thing, the other thing that I think needs to be discussed more is that people who work very hard at nonprofits who are effective at what they do should be paid well. They should be paid, they should be right. paid well. So they should be paid well. But here's my big beef with a lot of the nonprofits that come into public school. The, the big ones who cry poverty and have- That's yes, oh, not what I'm talking money. about. You're, you're not poor, so stop crying. Number right. two, you're, you're, using, you're using our children to play on white privilege to donate money basically for your salary. And no non and I believe- Oh! In, I believe in living wage, but no nonprofit should pay their sal should pay their employees more than a public school teacher. Because what we're seeing is the greatest suck on public education in communities like mine are very talented teachers who want to make a great change. And then right. you know what happens? It's tough to work with New York City Department of Education. I know, I did it. I walked away and I don't regret it, but I can't wait to go back. But you know, if I can go and work for a nonprofit organization and talk about salad and eating lettuce instead of having to worry about test scores and get paid more, guess what? I'm leaving to go to that nonprofit. And then these very nonprofits want to come and serve the schools that they're sucking the best talent out of and charge them. It's absurd. So please pay your people. I'm not saying work for free. I'm the only lunatic who's willing to do that. And I don't expect anybody to walk in my shoes. But please don't pay your staff more than you would pay a teacher to be in that school and do the work that needs to be done. Executive so directors do not make more than principals. And we're coming at it from, I think, different um, sort of sectors because yes, but I think, I think teachers should be paid more. I also think that um, Until they why, are should, why should a nonprofit that is out changing social mindset about something, why should they be paid less than an advertising executive? And that's where I come from. Cause I, you know, my stuff's like social media marketing. I think I think those advertising executives, so here's my take on that. There are a lot of people who are just getting paid too goddamn much. Yep. You know, if corporate America has all this money to give away, maybe they should look at redistributing it to their lowest paid employees and half the yep. social determinants of health that we're being forced to address would go away. So we can't do all of that, Diane. I try to be Superman and I know you are Superwoman. What we can do is advocate for small rational policy. And that thing, right. if, you're an, if you're a nonprofit whose staff is being paid more than a common teacher and your executive director is made more than a principal and you want to come to serve underserved communities, get the hell out. Don't even come. Go away. Go to Scarsdale. I now, also think- you in Scarsdale. Scarsdale's a great place. But I also think that part of our responsibility as people who've been in this movement for so many years is to inspire others to want to take on the big issues. You know, it's like, we're not going to take that on. But I want somebody who's just coming in, who's got a lot of passion, take on the salary as you expose, you know, the, the inequality in the nonprofit world or just in anything. I mean, I think that we, whether you like it or not, are at the point where we're becoming mentors. So yes, we still have our little piece to do, but I, well, I do got a believe lot to do. No little, I got a lot to do. You know, I get shit done. Okay, and speaking of, because we are getting toward the end, I heard rumors of a documentary coming out. Yeah, What's that? So I'm super excited about the Green Bronx Machine documentary. For two years, a bunch of filmmakers have been running around following our work across the country, and they are finally cobbling this thing together. I can't wait to see it. I've seen a million different versions of it. I know the ending because I'm still living it, but I can't wait to see how they are going to portray it. I'm super excited about that. 
I'm super excited that, you know, there's been a resurgence in the sales of my book. I'm super excited. So if you don't have a copy, please get one. 100% of the proceeds go to higher parents at living wage to work in public schools. Again, 100% of the proceeds go to support parents at living wage in public schools. And it comes with a double your money back guarantee. I'm really excited that the Green Bronx Machine curriculum, which comes with a lifetime site license, unlimited, you know, uh, no tiered subscriptions and no annualized fees is taking off across the country. Okay, and wait, 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 but go back to the documentary. Where's it coming out? Is it Netflix? Is it theaters? We don't know it yet. It may be oh, okay. you know, here and we're dealing with some uncertainty. People were talking about a national theatrical release. We are looking at the possibility of, you know, now people can't go to the movies. We are right. looking at the possibility of Netflix. We are looking at the possibility uh, of, you know, doing it, you know, just free sourcing it totally online with a website around that and creating content and curriculum and uh, and wait till you see how many people you know are in it. But the most important thing really are the children and, and it's really telling the children's story and what's possible. They've traced the children's history. I'm, you know, I'm super proud of, of the fact that we have the first wheelchair accessible commercial farm and commercial kitchen in America, right in the Bronx, and we did it quietly. We have the first foster care run commercial farm in Appalachia that is growing wow. food, earning money for foster care kids in the heart of cold country in the middle of the woods. How I can't, did that come about? But that came about through people watching the work that we were doing. And did they, but you went down there when it right. launched or to help them plan? Did you have, like, how did it come about? Was, you know, the, the amazing thing about Zoom and even before COVID is that, you know, there's a lot of stuff you can do online. Yes, I went down there to meet these people. I helped them raise some money. Um, they were all, we collectively went after some foundation money. And we're also proving that the cost efficacy of our work is mm. saving the nation and taxpayers so much money. Listen, Diane, when I learned that age 21, these children who age out of foster care are given a Medicaid card and dropped off at the homeless shelter. And with, with, yeah. with two words, good luck broke my heart. I'm proud to say that we now have a community of tiny homes that are being built by inmates who oh can't give back and help these children live a healthier, more realistic, you know, more beneficial life. So we have homes coming, a community, we're building ecotourism, it's Stepping Stones. So a big shout out to Susan Fry and my boys at Stepping Stone. I can't wait to come see you. We have a school in the heart of downtown Indianapolis where the kids, you can't so even- wait, wait, before you go on that, before you go into that, can people go to Stepping Stone to find out more information about the Tawny Absolutely. Homes? Absolutely. Yep, okay. Stepping Stone's residential care facility. My dear friend, Susan Fry, I'll write you back. You can follow all the news and exciting adventure that's on the Green Bronx Machine website and the Stephen Ritz uh, you know, social feed. We do it ourselves too. Uh, no paid so, and th there's nothing wrong with people getting paid for social media. But you know, so we really like to keep it authentic. We like to keep it grassroots. You can get involved. Grab a sustainable gangster T-shirt off our website. The purchase of one shirt buys a bag of groceries for a family in need, and the shirts are being made by women who are getting paid living wage to support their children as well. So we are big believers in the circular economy. I'm really excited in the UAE to be building the first food forest permaculture institute in, uh, you know, installation across the desert. My work with my adopted brother, the Green Sheikh, we are going to be bringing a farm to the desert and have a big camel parade. So I'll have to send you pictures oh. of the camel. I'm getting <laughs> back on the camel, Diane. Oh. Uh, just so you know, everyone, Steve. Like I tell the children. Camel. Wait, yeah. Steve oh. fell off a camel. And he broke ribs and didn't like wouldn't go to a doctor and flew back to the U.S. with all these broken ribs. So I don't like Steve on camels. Right, but I'm getting better. I'm learning to ride. And here's the notion: Good. can't stop, won't stop. You know, you want to be the change. You have to do it. Okay, so it's 1:30. Any final words? Thank you, and I love you. <laughs> I love you too, Steve. Thank I'm you. I'm not so saying much. goodbye. I'm saying I hope to see you soon. And remember, remember, lean in, do more, and let's try, you know, be safe, be well, and most importantly, be kind to yourself and others. That's Thank it. you, Steve. Thank, Thank you, you so God much. Thank you. you. Got it. Thanks, Diane. Love you. See you soon. Coming to Love your- Love you too, Steve. Rocks. Did you like that picture of me with the dog? Wasn't that adorable? I'm living vicariously through other people's dogs. I'm a good dog walker, if anybody <laughs> wants. Bring your dog to you the- 
They can't crap on it, but I'm happy to play with it. So everyone, Lauren Cardelli from A Growing Culture will be with us next week. But Steve, do you want to take us out with uh, Do the Right Thing? Uh, so listen, people, you know what to do. Do the right thing. You know, let us continue to be the light inside the tunnel instead of the light that we seek at the end. And the degree to which we resist injustice is the degree to which we are free. So if you are not standing with the oppressed, you are sitting with the oppressors. And on that note, adios. Thank you, everyone. I'll see you soon. Thank you, Steve. Bye. Bye-bye.